They're so awesome. Galatians chapter 5. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You know, um, one of the things that really kept me away from God when I was uh, an atheist, I was an atheist until I was about 19 years old. I did not believe in God, and I believed that God was for weak people that needed a crutch, and uh, I believe there's no such thing as God. And one of the things that kept me away from God is the thought that if I became a Christian, all the things that I couldn't do, like all the all the no's, all the you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, and me looking at it from the outside just looked like there were more rules, more regulations, um, more, more no's, and it was not attractive to me as a young person because... Um, Freedom is attractive uh, to young people, and it wasn't attractive to me at all. And so it really kind of kept me away from God for a good portion of my life because that's what I thought that it was. And, um, but once I, I come to know the Lord, I come to find out that really God's plan for our life is freedom. Um, God has freedom for us, and that's what He wants, and, and freedom is the way God operates. You know, um, If God wanted um, robots, then He would have never given us free will. And uh, God never forces you to do anything. Even in the garden, Adam and Eve have a choice. I mean, you know, if someone makes you do something, what you do doesn't really have a value because you're being made to do it. Like if I make my child tell me that they love me, uh, how many you know that's not really coming out of their heart? There's not power in that. But if they willfully have the ability to choose to love me, or choose not to love me, choose to tell me they love me, or choose not to, and they make a decision to love me, I mean, you know, that, that actually has impact, and there's power in that, and it's a beautiful thing, because it's something that's based upon choice, and, um, and so after having known the Lord, I realized that really what God wants for our lives is He wants freedom. He wants us to be free, and um, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again with the yoke of slavery. And so Jesus came, um, he came to bring us freedom. And how many know there are different uh, progressive levels of freedom? How many know you can get freer in God? Um, because the avenue that freedom comes is truth. I mean, you know, the more truth you hear and receive and believe, uh, you're going to get freer and freer and freer. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of things in this world that would try and control you, you know? I mean, you know, fear is something that tries to control people, right? And um, um, being afraid and being controlled is not freedom. You know, and Jerry was talking about a little bit during communion. How many of this world likes to try to make you afraid? And uh, because people know that, that fearful people are easily controlled. And, um, and so there's a lot of things that would try to rob us of freedom. There's a lot of things that would try to take that freedom away from us. How I many know oh, freedom is powerful? How I many our entire country was based upon freedom? The reason that America, you know, was even birthed is, you know, we took a stand for freedom. Our founding forefathers, they, um, they, they, a good portion of all the documents that, that our country is based on were biblical, scriptural, um, and they all geared around man's ability to have freedom. Uh, because one of, the, one of the things that I see play out in the world is there's always people that are trying to control everybody, and then there are people who are just trying to be free. And man, you see that play out in the church. Um, you see that play out in governments. You see that play out in, in, in even in, your, in our own personal lives. There's groups of people. I can never understand why anybody would want to control somebody else. Long as I live, I can't understand that. I, I just don't. What inside someone else makes them think that they have a right to control somebody else's life. Um, I, I hate that with a passion. I mean, you know, God has chosen not to control you. He has. I mean, you know, God could split this. He could split the sky right now, reveal Himself, and make everybody get born again. He could. I mean, He's so powerful. You know, even Jesus. You know, when He was uh, standing before Pilate, He said, "You know, He said, I can call twelve legions of angels right now." I mean, oh, God is strong enough and powerful enough to make everybody serve him. But he chooses not to. Because if he makes everybody serve him, 
then our adoration, it doesn't really mean much. I mean, oh, God wants a bride that loves him. He wants a bride that will choose him. And that, I mean, oh, that is something that actually means something. So in this life, um, you're going to, you, you're always going to have the ability to choose. You're always going to have that place of personal freedom. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. How I many you know love gives freedom? Fear always brings control. And um, God is looking to bring us into places of greater and greater freedom. That's what he wants to do in our lives. Um, Romans chapter 8 and verse 21, it says, I'm just going to go through a few of these scriptures here. It says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There is a glorious freedom uh, that's going to come upon the body of Christ. There's a glorious liberty. There's a, a freedom. You know, and when I was growing up, the church wasn't defined by freedom. They were defined really by more rules and more bondage and fear and control. But God has a freedom for his people that he wants to unveil um, to the entire world. And uh, that freedom is, is beautiful and that freedom is attractive. How I many you know currently worldwide we're not really operating in it? You know, the, the, the church is not known necessarily for its freedom. But the day is coming when the church will be known by its freedom. Because the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Wherever Jesus is in that place, there's freedom. I mean, when Jesus walked the road with his disciples, he carried a freedom about him. There was freedom in what they were doing. I mean, know that their freedom challenged the religious people. They're like, wait, your disciples are eating bread and they didn't wash their hands. I mean, on the presence of Jesus, they, they experienced a freedom where they didn't feel like they had to cow down and bow down to these religious leaders in order to feel okay about themselves. I mean, oh, Jesus carried a freedom, so much of a freedom, I mean, oh, the children were attracted to him. The kids wanted to come to him. How many of oh, kids love freedom? Inside of every one of us, we are born with an appreciation for freedom. We're born with that appreciation. But over time, how I many of this world can wear you down and turn you into a slave? You know, it, it, it tries to... There, how many know oh, there are those that want to control you? How many of oh, the media wants to control you? How many of the marketers want to control you? They want to control what you buy. They want to control how you feel. All these types of things. You know, and even war. You know, even... Uh, you know, the, the wars that are taking place on this planet, it's one group of people trying to control another group of people. And how I many you know in the church, we've seen tremendous amounts of control. How I many you know legalism, the very birthing ground of legalism is control. But the whole time, God's plan has been a freedom, has been a glorious liberty that he wants to unveil and reveal to his people. And, and the two primary ways that this freedom comes to us, number one is through truth. How I many you know the more truth you get, the more free you are. I mean, you know, lies always bring bondage. Lies always bring control. But when truth is received, freedom comes. Amen? And then also the presence of the Lord brings freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so God is always um, bringing about freedom in our lives and wants to bring greater and greater degrees of freedom into our lives. And I mean, you know, all of us here, we're enjoying an element of freedom now. I'm freer now than I was five years ago. I'm freer now than I was 10 years. I, I, I have a greater level of freedom, but I know God wants to make, set me more free. Can I get an amen? And so that is, that is the relationship you have with truth. That's the relationship you have with Jesus. He's always going to be leading you into a greater place of freedom. And so um, I, I love that, and I'm excited about that, and I'm thankful for that. But then Jesus, he has this easy light yoke that he places upon your shoulders. It's not burdensome. Um, it, it's not filled with obligation and fear-filled debt to him. It's an easy light yoke that he actually places on, upon our hearts. And how I many you know as you sit under the goodness of God and the love of God and the gospel, out of your heart, there comes a desire to serve God. And that is freedom. You have a want to do what's right. You have a want to. Now, I have a desire to do things that I used to feel like I was forced to do in order to try to get God to move, in order to try to get God to love me or to bless me. But the more the truth has come to me and set me free, I have this easy light yoke with Jesus where it's a relationship. And now, like, I want to serve God. I want to tell people about Jesus. And so it's like I'm still, you're walking with the Lord and you're doing the things that are right, but it's out of a place of freedom. It's just like when your children want to do what's right. 
Y'all tracking me here? You have moments where you're, that's what we try to create an environment in our home where we're one, because we want their hearts more than we want the forced obedience of their hand. You know what I'm saying? Like I can make my kids do what's right, but in me making them do what's right, sometimes their heart gets forgotten and they're not actually living out of their heart. I'm more concerned about their heart and them wanting it. And I mean, it's easier to get your kids dressed in the morning when they want to. Like this morning, everybody was tired in the house. I was up. You know, I usually get up way earlier than everybody else, and then I go about trying to wake everybody up. <laughs> I give everybody there. I give Ethan three or four wake-ups. I give my wife a few wake-ups, and I'm just slowly, because I'm like the only morning person in the house. Everybody else is not a morning person. So I'm just kind of waking everybody up, getting everybody up, and then, uh, so I'm waking them, and all of a sudden, Lily gets up, and man, she pops out of bed. She said, take me downstairs. I go to church. <laughs> I mean, she, as soon as she got up, man, I mean, that was like, so how I many know it's easier to direct a child that wants to than it is to direct a child that does not want to. And because she wanted to, man, we got her dressed. We got everything ready. It was a whole lot easier and funner endeavor. Now, listen, it ain't like that every morning. <laughs> now they always want to come. The kids always want to come to church, but they don't they don't always want to get up. They don't always want to get, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's not always. So I don't want to paint this picture like, in the Johnson house, we were always like, yay, we want to go to church and we're ready. No, it's not like that. But this morning it was, because I just want to be honest and vulnerable, right? But she wanted to, and out of her wanting to, it was a lot easier to do it. And so with God, God wants to get to your heart and he wants to get to your want to. And that's what the gospel does. The gospel gets to your place of desire. It gets to your place of want to. Like, you know, I used to be forced to give. We were, we were scared into giving. We were forced into giving. We were manipulated into giving. Me and Dan, we, we go way back, and it, it was awful. Like, when, when someone makes you do something that you don't want to do, I mean, it doesn't really mean much. But as I've sat under the grace of God, and I've sat under the love of God, and I know God loves me whether I give or not. Can I get an amen? I know I'm blessed whether I give or not. Can I get an amen? And I know that I was blessed before because I was blessed because I received Jesus. Can I get an amen? But now it's like there's an excitement about giving. Like we took up that offering for Tim last week. And man, we took up a several thousand dollar offering for him, man. And, and just got to just bless him. And like we wanted to. We were excited about it. We wanted to help him. It wasn't like I was standing up here. Now listen, y'all. Y'all got to give. Y'all got to dig deep. And y'all need to give because y'all are y'all. Demand, 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 demand. It wasn't like that. It was a, hey man, we have a brother that's in need. Let's help him. Very simple. Not this big, weird, long, you know, uh, manipulation, all of these things. We, out of a place of love, we wanted to help him. And then our, our little church got a chance to just bless his socks off, man. And how many of you know that feels good? How many of you know that is freedom? That's out of a place of want to, right? And uh, this is what God has for us. And and another thing to realize is there's greater and greater levels of freedom. But what I want to talk about this morning is I want to, I want to talk about, because I talk a lot about freedom. I talk a lot about the gospel. I've written books about it. I love the subject of freedom. I love freedom. I love it. And, um, and God loves it too. And, but what I want to talk about, I want to just take a look at a few things that would try and steal our freedom. And how we need to keep those, we need to keep those things with without having impact or effect in our life. Listen, no one has the right to control you. Nobody. Can you get an amen? No one has the right to control you. If the Lord has set you free, then who has the right to control you? And so what I want to encourage you is you've been called to freedom. Stand fast in that liberty and don't let anybody control you. How many of you know they were trying to control the apostle Paul? In the early church. And he was like, stand fast in your freedom. How I many of you know they were trying to control the Galatian church? And he came and encouraged them, stand fast in your freedom. Because the enemy doesn't like when God's people are free. Because when God's people are free and we're experiencing liberty, the Bible says all of creation is groaning and travailing, waiting for us to get free. The experience of freedom. Because I believe that when we can demonstrate freedom to the world... The world will be attracted to Jesus. But as long as we're just in bondage as the world, we're not attractive to 
We're, we're not making Jesus attractive. Jesus isn't revealed, and so people just look at us as more rules, more regulations, and more uh, types of control. A lot of people stay out of church because they see how much control happens in the church. And they've been bitten by it, and they're afraid of it. But that's not the plan of God. God wants freedom for us, and that's God's plan for us. So Romans chapter 8, please. And we're going to take a look at this this morning. And I've talked a little bit about this, but I want to just address it, you know, just specifically here for a moment. And, and uh, you know, 365 times in the Bible, it, it tells us to fear not. Um, God does not want you. How many of you know God does not want us to be afraid of man? God does not want us living in a state of fear. I mean, you know, when you're in a state, when you're afraid, you're less likely to be free. I mean, you know, if you're afraid to speak, you won't speak freely. I mean, you know, if you're if you're afraid to act or you're you're in a place of fear, fear is a freedom stealer. And so the enemy is always trying to inject fear into the hearts of God's people. Number one, to make them miserable, but number two, to keep this glorious liberty from manifesting so that all the wonderful things that can happen in this glorious liberty can happen in terms of evangelism and the church becoming attractive and just people enjoying their lives and enjoying the kingdom. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, it says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you have received brought about your adoption to sonship. By him we cry, Abba, Father. And so... Um, how I many you know that our relationship with God is not marked by fear and slavery and control? It's marked out of a place of relationship. Now, I'm not saying the fear of the Lord is bad. The fear of the Lord is good. The fear of the Lord is enduring. The fear of the Lord is healthy. It is the beginning of wisdom. But the end of the commandment is love. How I many you know you can grow in relationship to where you're not doing the right thing because you're afraid of punishment or afraid of repercussion, you're doing the right thing because you love God. How I many of that's a higher form of relationship? I can remember years ago, we, we took over uh, this youth, uh, we, we had this youth facility in downtown Frankfurt. And um, we, when we first took it over, man, these kids had just been pounded with fear and control. And, and they were just like, not in a good place. And Initially, when we first took it over, they did not know how to have a real relationship with us. It was all about us <laughs> punishing them for doing what was wrong. How I many know if kids live in a state of constantly expecting punishment, then you, like a kindergarten teacher, all you do is walk around and correct, 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 correct. I mean, that's exhausting. That's exhausting for the kids, and that's exhausting for us. And so we spent that first six months just basically trying to earn their trust. We first went into that place. They had this massive stage built. And so the, 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 the ministers were like way up high and the kids were way down low. And it was like this separation of how awesome the ministers were and how low the kids were. Man, we tore that thing down the first week we were there. We literally ripped it out and threw it out and we'd sit in the floor with the kids. Because how many you know, as a leader, you're not better than anybody else. Can't get an amen. I mean, there's nobody in this room that's any better than anybody else. And slowly what we did is we proved to them that we loved them. And you know what happened? Slowly, all those little disciplinary corrections and actions, all those things left. And then they, began, they knew we loved them. And as they knew that we loved them and respected them, they began to love and respect us. And we, would be, we became a family. And we love those kids. And sometimes y'all see them come in here. You'll see kids that we used to minister to. And they'll come in here with their kids and stuff like that. And, um, you know, Jesse has come many, many times. And when Jesse first came into that building, he was one of the hardest kids we've ever had in our life. I had to wrestle him to the ground one time. <laughs> and he was, a ch I mean, his kid was a challenge. But you know what? Towards the end of the time we were together, I'd lay my life in that kid's hand. And I know it wouldn't hit the ground. Because, because he knew that I cared about him. So he loved me back. He knew that I respected him. He respected me back. I'm saying all that to say this, you can have the low level of fear of repercussion type of relationship. How I many that's a low level of relationship? Or you can go into a higher level of love and respect. And in that place, I'm enjoying the relationship. The kids are enjoying the relationship. How I many know it's the same with God? I probably first came to the, really, I came to the Lord because I was miserable and I hated my life. But a lot of us, how I many know many of us, we can come out of a place of fear. 
And that may, and that's fine. How many of us better to be afraid and get saved than not get saved at all? I mean, I believe that. The Bible says that you, there, there, I mean, for sure. But how many of y'all, that's a low level. How many of y'all, God wants to take you into a higher place of relationship? I don't give now because I'm scared of the curse or I'm scared of me being cursed or I'm scared of God. I give because I want to. I tell people about Jesus because I, because I have a desire to. Y'all tracking me here. And so God wants to take us out of a low level of relationship into a high rev- level of relationship that's actually based on his love for us and our love for him. How many of you, know you can go to a higher level of relationship with God? Amen. Can I get an amen on that, right? We make that transition. We go into a higher level. And so fear, um, although the fear of the Lord is good, the defining characteristic of your life shouldn't be fear. The defining characteristic of your life should be love. Now listen, Old Testament saints, that's all they had. How many of they weren't saved? They weren't born again, so they didn't have a love nature. So under the old covenant, the primary motivating force for serving God was fear of God. That's why everybody, people did the right thing because they were scared of God. And that's great, and that's fine, and that's good, but there's a higher level. And when Jesus came, how many know you don't have a fear nature anymore? How many know you now have a love nature? And so now the love of God will compel you and constrain you, and you'll enter into a more mature relationship with God. And so fear is something that we want, we want to endeavor to keep the fear, the fear of this world, the fear of man out of our lives. How do we do that? We just feed on love. Feed on love, and then also don't tolerate fear. I mean, fear could sneak in and start living in your life. And you have to realize it's not normal and it's not okay. Like I've had times in my life where I watched too much news and I got real weird about locking my doors. I'm not anti-locking. I still lock my doors. You know what I'm saying? Because I think that, you know, that's a smart thing to do or whatever. But how many know you can lock your door out of wisdom and you can lock your door out of terror? And if you're locking your door out of terror, you're doing it wrong. And you need to take care of that fear and get it out of your house. You need to acknowledge it and take care of it, right? You can't let it run rampant. It's not allowed in you, right? So a part of remaining in a place of freedom is recognizing when fear is there, kicking it to the curb. How many of y'all this world's trying to instill in you fear of lack right now? Egg prices, this price, that price, blah, blah, blah. Listen, you're of a kingdom that's not of this world. And God said, you seek me first and my kingdom first. I'll bring all, I'll add all these things to you. Can I get an amen? You're not just going to survive in this season. You're going to thrive and God's going to use you to bless somebody else. Can I get an amen? You're a storehouse. Amen. And, but how many know you can't, you can't, you have to guard against fear. Fear will try to come in. How many know that's not God's will for your life? Amen. So when you see fear, recognize it, recognize that it's evil and it's not of God and it's not from God. Just like if I walked into my house when I get home from church and I see a snake in my home, how I many know I'm not going to curl up on the couch while there's a snake in my home? Some of y'all might like snakes. I ain't one of them people. That snake, going to he's going to leave or he's going to die. Those are his two options. He will not coexist with me, right? I'm going to get rid of him. How I many of y'all fear should be the same way? And we have to be careful because we can have times in our life where we tolerate fear and we get so used to fear that we don't even realize that it's there because we've been living with it for so long. And so if there's something that's making you afraid, it needs to be addressed, right? I'm not saying there aren't things that you deal with or things that you may be afraid of or something like that. I'm not addressing that. I'm just talking about you living in a state of fear. That's not God's will for your life because it won't allow you to be free. How many of God wants freedom for you? He does not want you to be afraid. Can I get an amen? Okay. And so now um, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We want to talk about this. Church covers this a lot, uh, not necessarily this specific church, but the church, you know, worldwide. But I do think it's an important thing to say, um, and I do want to take just a moment of time, and I want to teach on it. And uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. So fear is something that would try to rob you of freedom. And so we have to take, we have to take authority over fear. We have to continue to receive the love of God. Don't put our eyes on the things of this world. Put our eyes on the kingdom. I have no desire to live in fear in 2023. I'm not going to walk afraid. I'm not going to be afraid of wars and rumors of wars and lack and all that bunch of crap. I refuse to do all that. Can I get an amen? Y'all join me in that. Now, it may try to come. It may knock on the door, but I'm not answering that door. I'm shutting that door in its face. I'm not going to tolerate that. You have to be aggressive with those types of things. You cannot tolerate them. You're not called to live like that. Amen? And um, so anyway, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Sin is a robber of freedom. Now, let me lay this out to you. If you've received Jesus as Lord and Savior, how many know you're forgiven? How many know you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? How many know you're on your way to heaven and can't nothing stop you? Because you're born again, you have a new nature. How many know your right standing with God is not an action or a behavior? Your right standing with God is a person and his name is Jesus. If you've received Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're the righteousness of God. That's not going to be taken away from you. You have that uh, from, from eternity. You are, now, you are now in eternal life. Okay, get an amen. We're not going to take that away. But how many know sin will still try to rob you? How I many you know, even as a believer, even as a born-again child of God, how I many you know sin is still going to try to ensnare? And, and this, this passage, Hebrews chapter 12, this is actually written to believers. And, and what, he, what he's doing here, he's saying, be careful that there's not a sin that would try to ensnare you and, and rob you of freedom. Have you ever been addicted to something? I have long lists of, of things that I've been addicted to. When you're addicted to something, you're not free. Amen. And, and uh, enemies always trying to bring in, trying to bring something. Now, one of the primary reasons the enemy tries to bring in sin and temptation is so he can try to bring in condemnation. He's going to try to condemn you. He's going to try to convince you um, that you are someone that you're actually not. How many know you're not a sinner any longer? Can I get an amen? You're a child of God. Now, as a child of God, we still have the ability to make mistakes. We still have the ability to step over into that. Enemy still has the ability to tempt us, but that is not who we are. But the enemy will bring in a temptation. He'll try to bring in sin for the purpose of robbing you of freedom. How many know when you are under condemnation, you are not experiencing freedom? When you think God is mad at you, when you think God is against you, when you think God, I, I'm just, I feel so bad. Not, I, my heart goes out to these people who think God hates them. Y'all made this simple statement on Facebook the other day. I just said, God's not mad at you, right? Man, people get so offended at that statement. People want an angry God, and uh, they want him to be mad. And I make that statement, you know, and I make that statement on my personal page, and most of the people on my personal page are pretty familiar with my ministry and stuff like that. But then I have, like, a, a ministry page, and, man, I get all kinds of flack on the ministry page. I mean, people, they just come at me nonstop. I don't even reply to them. It's like, if you don't understand, it's cool. I'm not going to take all day to explain it to you, you know, because I don't have time for that. But people don't understand that simple concept. I mean, you know, if you think God's mad at you, that's not freedom. And it's going to be a real challenge for you to walk as a son and daughter of God when you think God is living in a state of disappointment towards you. I mean, you know, God's not mad at anybody in this room. God's not mad at anybody online. I mean, oh, God's not even mad at anybody in the world. He's not. How I many oh, he wants to save them, right? Um, his, his, how I many oh, the, the judgment of God towards sin was placed upon the body of Jesus Christ. He that knew no sin became sin. And so, man, we, sin was annihilated on the cross, right? Now, we're in this grace period. And how I many oh, there'll come a time when there'll be accountability for rejecting Jesus? There will be. Um, but right now, God's not living in a state of anger. God's not stealing towards his people. I mean, oh, God hates sin. God hates death. God hates the devil. Can I get an amen? He hates these things that would try to hurt us or harm us. But the enemy has worked overtime to try to convince the body of Christ that God is mad at them. And if God is mad at you, you are not, if you believe that God is mad or disappointed in you, you're not experiencing freedom in your relationship with God. But the enemy tries to do that. But, so, but still, sin can try to knock, sin can try to come in. And it says, the sin which so easily ensnares. Now that word ensnares um, in, in, in the Greek is uh, Strong's number 2139. It's euperistias, and it means easily surrounding, encircling, easily distracted. Easily surrounding, encircling. I mean, if you're surrounded by something, you don't have freedom to move forward. Right? And the enemy would try to bring in something that would rob you of freedom. And so he's always trying to do that. One of these things is sin. And then another definition of that, a serious hindrance that encircles or hampers someone who desperately needs to advance. So the enemy's trying to bring that in. And I mean, we take a stand against it, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 23, it says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. <clears throat> How many of you as a believer, who stole my water today? 
Somebody snag my water. <laughs> I had a water up here somewhere. Could somebody get me one if you don't care? Thank you. Um, I know I had one. I don't know what happened to it, but it's all good. Um, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because I know this drum is beat quite a bit. But how many know, even as a person that understands the gospel and understands grace, you have to understand the enemy is going to still try to bring something in that ensnares you. How many know all things are lawful for you, but how many know not everything edifies, not everything is good for you? Everybody tracking me here? I'm getting so few amens on this, but this is the truth. It's right here, man. Thank you, sir. They were like, you preaching on sin. I thought this was a grace church. It's true. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12, it says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And I've known, and I've known people who have gotten a hold of grace, and they understand they're forgiven. They understand they're right with God, but out of their liberty, the enemy used their liberty against them. And then what ends up happening is they started kind of abusing their liberty and using it as a cloak of maliciousness. And then they got hooked up to something that actually brought them under its power. Y'all tracking me here? How many know, how many know that, 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 that sin, even in a believer's life, has the ability to destroy their life? How many know there are Christians who have died before their time? I've, I've ministered in the shelter, and there were people I know were saved. I know they were saved people, but they went back to drugs, and they overdosed, and they died. Know them. Now, here's the thing. I believe they're in heaven because they're born again. But what happened was the enemy brought them under his power, and he snuffed out their life. I know of another girl, and this is a good, this is a really good testimony but I can remember she was in there. She was really hungry for God. She was drawing. I loved having her into, when I was ministering in the shelter. How many of people draw on the message? And those people are a blessing. You guys don't understand how much of, 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 of what goes on is we're all doing this together. It's not just the preacher. And when somebody's hungry, man, they're pulling. And this girl was so hungry. She was really moving to the things of God. And then I didn't see her for a long time. But then the next time she was in there, I saw her and you could tell she had been through hell. But man, I could feel the Lord, God just spoke right out of my mouth to her. And this doesn't happen to me very often, but basically warning her that if she went back, because what had happened was she had left the shelter. She went back to the people she used to run with. She got back out on the street. She got back to using drugs. And I, we had an unusual service where, man, just the prophetic came on me real strong. And I actually had to stop the service and go pray for her. But God was warning her if she went back to that life that she would die that she would die. And you know what? She didn't. And she chose God. And she continued to move forward. And man, you take one look at that girl. She's Jesus from the top of her head to the soles of, your, of her feet. If y'all been to any of the outreaches, I can tell you who she was. You know exactly who I'm talking about. Very hungry for God. And she made a decision. But what happened was that sin knocked on her door and tried to bring her under its power to control her, to destroy her. And I know those are, those are very... Um, that's the word I'm looking for. Those are extreme examples. But how many of the enemy is always trying to bring something into your life to control you? Right? How many know if, if the enemy can bring in a, a sense of gossip or slander into your life? How many know that one, one of the ways that gossip or slander operates is it tries to tear somebody else down to bring more value to yourself? How many know that's not freedom? How many of you as a believer, we're not called to gossip or slander other people. But how many of the enemy would try to bring that in? He would try to bring that in and try to rob people of freedom. And so it doesn't have to just be, how I many you know anger is not freedom? If someone has the ability to, you know, when, when, the, when the pandemic first started and, and I, had, I had like the perfect storm of, of, you know, being just upset at everything that was going on and, and my dog was driving me crazy and, and all these things came together. And I had this season of my life where I was living angry and I'm not naturally an angry person, but I, that anger... <clears throat> How I many of you, know, you can't compartmentalize sin? You can't just keep it contained. And so what was happening was because there were things that were happening that were making me angry and making me offended, and I just saw the injustice and the things that were happening, I got angry, and I lived angry for a little bit. And you know what? It made my life hard. And it also made the lives of those around me hard. And what had happened was I was brought under the power of the offense and anger that was in this world, and it robbed me of freedom. 
and God had to get me out of that. Because how many know if you live angry, you're not in control? It'll rob you of freedom. And see, and you may have a right in the sense that you see injustice, but if you allow offense and anger to rule your heart and rule your life, then someone else is controlling you. Amen? How many know God doesn't want that for you? Now God set me free. Praise God. It was a short season. It wasn't a long season. But I had a season where I was dealing with that. So I'm just giving you some examples beyond just like the extremes of drug addiction. How many know there are little things that the enemy wants to try to bring into your life to rob you of freedom? And sin would be, one, would be an avenue that the enemy would bring that in. Because when sin comes in, not only does it try to bring you into the power, how many of it tries to convince you that you are that sin? And as you hear the gospel, you got to understand, you are not defined by your failure, you're defined by your Savior. Can I get an amen? Your identity is what's going to set you free to rise up out of that, right? And, um, and then he also, when, when sin comes, he tries to bring in that sense of condemnation and all of these types of things. So anyway... Um, that is one of the things that try to rob us of freedom as well. Um, and then let's take a look at uh, Galatians chapter 5. And I alluded to this just a moment ago. But how I many know one of the things that's really <laughs> been covering the beautiful face of Jesus is legalism. How I many know legalism operates in control, right? You go to a church where your, your pastor is never going to control you. I'm never going to guilt you into coming to church. I'm never going to guilt you into evangelism. I'm never going to guilt you into giving. I'm never, I'm going to treat you the same no matter what. I'm going to, I'm going to love you no matter what. I'm not going to look less of you if you make a mistake or you have a failure. You're not going to be controlled. But how many of there are whole sections of the body of Christ that they live in a state of being controlled? The pastor is not really a shepherd. He's a taskmaster and he's in, in a position of basically saying, okay, you're approved of God. You are not approved of God. You need to try harder. You need to do more. This person's awesome. You should be more like this person. So what ends up happening is, is it sets up this dynamic of the house of God, rather than it being a family that's filled with love and freedom and growth, you have a taskmaster who controls you, holding the punishment of God over your head all the time, holding the curse over your head all the time, and you're living in a state of being manipulated. How many of you know there's a lot of manipulation in the church, unfortunately? And uh, some of us have come out of that. And uh, I'd say most of us have probably come out of that. Unfortunately, that's kind of the norm. Uh, but, but true leadership shouldn't manipulate you. True leadership <clears throat> shouldn't control you. Uh, true leadership really should serve you and should point you to Jesus, right? And so one of the things that can rob you of a couple of the things, number one, we talked about fear. Fear can rob you of freedom. Sin can rob you of freedom. And then legalism has the ability to rob you of freedom. And so if you actually look at the context of that verse that I started with, it's actually in reference to legalism. We won't spend a lot of time on this because we talk about this a lot, but I do want to touch it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now, we don't deal in, the, in our modern day so much with circumcision, but how many know that people will try to put something on you to determine if you don't do that, you're not right with God? And if you do that, you are right with God. And I'm talking about something external. How many of there are people who would look at me because I have long hair, they would think I'm not right with God? There'd be people who would judge me. And how many of there would be people who would judge you based on your clothes? Or judge you based upon anything that's external? And so what he's saying here is you're, these external things are not what saves you. These external things are not what makes you right with God. <clears throat> how many know your rightness with God is not based on your giving? Can I get an Amen. I mean, the thief on the cross didn't give a dime and he was saved. Can I get an amen? And so, but a lot of times in the body of Christ, people are like, man, you know, I just hate that thought process. Like if someone doesn't tithe or whatever, then now they're under the curse and God's mad at them, all these types of things. And it's just not true. You cannot prove that in New Testament scripture. Yes, Malachi chapter three, verse 10 is true for the old covenant. But under the new covenant, how I many of Jesus became a curse to redeem you from the curse and Jesus did a good job. You have to add anything to that to make that happen. But legalism comes in and it tries to control. So the Galatian church was birthed in freedom, 
But there were those who came from James who were mixing the covenants at that time, and they were Judaizers, and they were trying to bring them back into bondage, back into control. And, um, and so uh, Paul goes on and says, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, nothing external but faith, which works through love. Right? He said, You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. In other words, he's like, there are people trying to control you. And this didn't come from God. This came from man. Which leads me to my final portion here. When God wants to bless you, he'll send somebody into your life. When the enemy wants to destroy you, he'll send somebody into your life. How many know that there are people who would try to rob your freedom? And, and you have to realize it, and it can come in the form of fear. It can come in the form of, of, you know, of sin or temptation. It can come in the form of legalism. See, the Galatian church wasn't infiltrated by some type of spirit entity. The devil didn't walk in and try to fool them. How I many you know people walked in and tried to fool them? People who were fooled by the enemy. People who did not understand what was going on. Didn't understand the new covenant, right? They were Judaizers. They thought they had to be circumcised in order to be saved. They thought they had to keep the law of Moses to be justified. Listen, I don't think they were bad people. They just didn't understand. How I many know freedom looks like rebellion to people who are still in slavery? Freedom looks like rebellion to people who are still in slavery. And so um, I don't think they were necessarily bad people, but they were just people who didn't understand, and the enemy used that to try to really stop what was going on in the Galatian church. I mean, no, we don't want to be man-controlled or man-centered. Can I get an amen? We want, to be, we want to be in fellowship with Jesus. I want God to control me. I ch if you're smart, you'll choose to let God control you. Seriously. Like, the, the longer I live, the more I realize I can't do anything apart from Jesus. I need His wisdom in everything, every aspect of my life. And that's a great... I, I, I give up my freedom to trust in His direction. Can I get an amen, right? So anyway, now let's, let's go to, um, let's flip over to Galatians chapter three. And I want to hit this last point. So I want to talk about people taking away freedom, people taking away freedom and, and, and how you have to guard against this Galatians chapter three and verse one, it says, um, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. He used the word bewitched here, right? And, and so these, these that came in, these Judaizers, they were coming in, <clears throat> they were trying to bring people into a place of fear and subservience and control. And how many know it actually worked on everybody but Paul initially? How many know great people were manipulated by these people? What are you talking about? <clears throat> how many know Peter was eating with the Gentiles? Until they came. How I many old Barnabas was eating with the Gentiles? He was fellowshipping with the Gentiles. And so they were in a place of doing things the right way. How I many old God wanted to save the Gentiles? God had this big plan where it wasn't just going to be the children of Israel. God's going to bring in the Gentiles. Thank God he was success. How I many know we're all Gentiles, right? But because there were those that came in that looked to manipulate them through fear, Paul, or excuse me, Peter, walked over to their side. Barnabas, a good man, walked over to their side. The only person that stayed free was Paul. And he took a stand. And he rebuked everybody. And it's recorded in Scripture. Paul rebuked the apostle Peter. And how many of Peter was highly esteemed? How many of Peter was the leader of the early church? Peter was a, he was a mighty man. Peter's shadow healed people. But what I want to show you is, Peter, like all people, are susceptible to be manipulated by people. And if you want to maintain your freedom, you're going to have to make a decision to not allow people to manipulate you. I grew up in a home where I was manipulated. Um, and and I, I can say it now, like me and my mom, we have a great relationship now. But my mom had a very rough upbringing, 
And my mother basically controlled me through her emotions and through, I was just controlled. I was enslaved uh, to her, basically to her every whim. And I didn't get free until I became a Christian and really until I got plugged into a church and I did not get free from my mother's control. How many know if you, how many know witchcraft is more than just witch hats and cauldrons and spells? Witchcraft is when someone else tries to control you through their emotions. And there is a spirit of manipulation and control. And it tries to operate through people. And when I was a kid, it operated through my mom. And I had to get set free from it. How do you get set free from it? You tell it no. And you tell it, you can't control me. And I, and see, and they're like, well, but if you don't do what I want, then I'm going to get hurt or I'm going to get mad or I'm going to get whatever. And you've got to stand fast in your liberty and you've got to say, no, you're not manipulating me and you're not controlling me. You will not enjoy the freedom that God has for your life if you allow people to manipulate and control you through their emotions. They could do it through anger. They could do it through pity. They could do it through fear. You're not called to be controlled. And if you, if, if God reveals to you that there's a relationship in your life where someone is trying to manipulate you and control you through their emotions, God wants to set you free from that because that person's not going to get set free as long as they can manipulate you and control you. See, I got, I got separated from my mom for a time. And, and, and because she was operating in that, that's what she was raised in. It's all she ever knew. But you know, today, me and my mom have a great relationship. And my mom is completely set free from witchcraft, manipulation, and control. And now my mom doesn't try to control me at all. And now we have a great relationship. She's free and I'm free. But she didn't get free until I stopped feeding that thing. Some people, they don't even know how to be any other way. That's the only way they know how to be is to manipulate and control people through acceptance or rejection or or fear, or pity, or whatever, and it happens a lot, I mean, and you have to guard against it. You cannot allow somebody to control you. It happens a lot in ministry. People can get in this codependent type of relationship with someone, and, and it sets this thing up for, for manipulation and control. But see, when Paul took his stand, how many of y'all, Paul took a stand for freedom? Listen to me. It did not just impact Paul's life. 2,000 years later, the reason we still have the preservation of the freedom of the gospel is Paul took a stand for freedom and wouldn't allow anybody else to control him. If Paul would have bowed down like Peter and Barnabas did, the gospel would have been lost. Amazing, isn't it? Thank God. And see, and Paul would say this, all forsook me, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And so... As you make a decision to get set free from all forms of control, whether that's fear, sin, legalism, or people trying to control you, not only are you setting the stage for freedom for yourself, but you're going to pass freedom on to your children. We don't, we don't have a spirit of manipulation and control in my house. My kids are not raised in that. And the reason they're not raised in that is by the grace of God, I made a decision to take a stand against that. Amen? So what I'm saying is, not only does it impact you, how many of it impacts those around you as well? Amen? And, and you are not called to be subservient to anybody's emotions or anybody's happiness. How many know you got to let God lead you? How many know you got to let God lead you? How many know you got to let God lead you? Sometimes God will lead you and make other people mad. Yeah. Hallelujah. I had a time here recently where I was... <sighs> See, when you're raised in it, you, know, you, you, feel, you feel this desire to cow down to it. That spirit's always trying to come back around in my, it, towards me. I mean, just because I was raised in it. <clears throat> I had to make a decision to stand against it and to discern it and to see what it is. But I had a time here recently where... I was doing some ministry stuff and all that, and, and there was somebody who was pretty high-ranking or whatever, and God had told me to do it this way, but they wanted to do it that way. And they really wanted me to do it that way, but I knew what God had told me. I had a decision to make. 
Am I going to bow down and please this individual through, the, through their pressure, or am I going to follow God? I chose to follow God. And you know what? I made them mad. But you know what? I don't care. Because I would rather follow God than please everybody. Can't get an amen on that. Now, they're not a bad person. They're a wonderful person. But they were in a moment where they were caught up in the flesh. They're used to everybody doing what they say. They're used to being in control. They're used to being the boss. They're used to being the big wig. But <clears throat> I answer to God. You answer to God. Can I get an amen? And, and what that spirit of witchcraft and control will try to do, <clears throat> it'll try to put you in a position where you feel like you've got to please this individual. You've got to make them happy. You've got to satisfy them. Because if, you're, if you don't satisfy them and you don't please them, they're going to throw a fit. They're going to be mad. They're going to be hurt. They're going to be... Full, they're going to say, you know, pity me or think about me or I'm going to be mad at you or whatever. Whatever form of emotion they use to throw at you and to try to control your decision making, you've got to cut that thing off. How many of there have been people who've been in relationships that were destructive to them because they were, because they were being controlled by someone else's emotions? Now listen to me. I'm not saying the people that are dealing with this are bad people. I'm saying that those people are caught up in something that's destroying them and looking to destroy other people's lives as well. My mom's a great example of it. My mom's free now. My mom don't try to control anybody except my stepdad. Praise God. <laughs> so be it. Let it be, God. <laughs> it ain't me, God. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, what I'm saying is you have to take a stand for that. How I many know oh, you can't walk in the freedom that God has for you and people still be able to manipulate you and control you with their emotions. Amen? Proverbs 29 and verse 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare. When you're afraid of what people think about you, or what other people think about you, you will be controlled. I mean, a snare is something that removes freedom. A snare is a rope that's tied around somebody's leg and holds them down. If you're afraid of what people think about you, you can't really follow God. If you're afraid of what people are going to say about you or, or what type of emotional temper tantrum they're going to throw or, or what type of light they're going to paint you in or whether they're going to slander your name or whatever. And you see, if you give place to that spirit of witchcraft and control, it's just going to get stronger and stronger in your life. And that snare is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the next thing you know, you aren't running your life anymore. Somebody else is. And you live your whole life trying to make sure this person's emotions are okay. I'm not talking about walking in love towards somebody. I'm not talking about taking care of somebody. I'm talking about somebody controlling you. You have not been called to be manipulated and controlled. You've been called to freedom. You've got to guard that freedom. And some, I mean, sometimes you've got to make some folks mad by doing what God says and not what somebody else says. <clears throat> and I'll be honest with you. If you preach this gospel and you carry this gospel, you're going to make all kinds of people mad. You know, and in the beginning, it really bothered me. Like, I, I, people would get mad at me, and I'd spend all day trying to explain to them <clears throat> and cow down to them. And I would, they, would, they would rob so much of my time. I didn't have time for ministering to the people who had ears to hear and also didn't have time to take care of my family because I was too busy on social media trying to argue with the naysayers. I'm not like that anymore. I do not care. Uh, when it comes to the gospel, I mean, like, if you want to be offended, be offended at the cross. I know it's an offensive message. I know it's an offense. It's good. It's the best news on earth, but it gives it gives man no credit and it gives God all credit. Man don't like that. And so there is a thickening of your skin that God will develop in you, and He'll do it in in as you enjoy His acceptance and His love, and you put more value on what He thinks about you than somebody else. As you put more value in what he thinks about you than somebody else, then you have the ability to resist somebody else's will, to break free from the snare of pleasing man, and live in a state of freedom. And listen to me, you're setting the stage for that person's deliverance. <clears throat> they're not going to get set free as long as their witchcraft works. They're not going to get free as long as it works. You are a part of their deliverance. You stand fast in your liberty, and that liberty can be passed on to them. It might not be. It's really none of your business. It's their choice. You can't make nobody get free. 
You can't make nobody receive. But you have to, we all have to be careful if we want this freedom and this liberty to grow in our lives. We can't allow people to wrap snares around our legs. Listen, you're not trying to get votes. You're not running for Christian political office. You tracking me here? You're not trying to get. I know a lot of Christianity runs like that, but it, but it's not really supposed to be like that. How many of you are just supposed to follow the Lord and do what God says? And 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 how many know there are times when Jesus did things that weren't popular? How many know the gospel's not popular? It's just not, man. I mean, you know what's popular? Self effort, self help. What can I do? How can I clean up? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? Me, 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 me. It's not about Jesus, it's about you and what you're doing. That's what's popular right now. And that's, it's cool, but I'll choose Jesus over all those games. Because once you get a taste of the freedom and liberty that the gospel provides, you don't want to go back to that. But there are some places of freedom that God wants to grow in your life that's not going to happen until you cut this snare off. Y'all tracking me here. All right, go to Romans 16, please. This will be the final place when we, when we close. Talk about freedom. Talk about increasing freedom. Freedom from fear. Freedom from control. Freedom from uh, uh, sin that would so easily ensnare you. Freedom from legalism. And then once again, freedom from people. <clears throat> the enemy will try to, get, to bring people into your life to control you. And you have to take a stand against it. Now listen, it doesn't mean you're a jerk. For the sake of being a jerk. Can I get an amen to that? You don't just want to be a jerk. Because someone can get a hold of this and not operate. See, <clears throat> the thing that makes your freedom healthy is love. Love is the guidance in the place of liberty. See, for love's sake, you may not do something that someone else has a problem with. What are you talking about? How I many of you know, love's sake, you'll serve somebody else. Even though their faith not, might be where you're at, you, out of love's sake, you'll abstain. Out of love's sake, you won't do something because you care about somebody and you'll pull back on your liberty out of love's sake. But love constraining you is different than someone else's emotions constraining you. Some people, they, live, they have lived their whole lives getting what they want by controlling people. Well, if I don't get what I want, then I'm going to throw a temper. It's basically like a toddler. It's a toddler type of mentality. How many of little kids, they don't know how to communicate, so they cry? And if people don't learn how to grow out of that, then how many know we have adults throwing temper tantrums? And they're, and they're, and they're throwing temper tantrums not they, so they could control other people to get other people to do what they want them to do. Hallelujah. <laughs> don't shut me down because I'm preaching good. It's true though. And how many know you can see those types of, how many know you can see that try to operate in your own life? I've seen those things try to operate in my own life because I was raised in it, but God has set me free and brought freedom into my life. How many know you don't have to act like that? Can I get an amen? And, and set us free from these things. But anyway, Romans chapter 16, in verse 17, it says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions. And offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learn, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and their own desire. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Here, Paul, the preacher of the gospel, the preacher of grace, he says, note the people that cause division. Note the people that cause offenses. Note them, because they're not serving God, they're serving their own desire. And with smooth words and flattering speech, they're manipulating people to do what they want to do, and it's not really about serving God at all. It's about being in control. And those are strong words, and that's coming from the Apostle of Grace. But in order for freedom to grow in your life, you have to make a decision to not be controlled. Amen? And, and, and really, the way that we gain strength to stand against manipulation and control is our relationship with God. You know, just like the word that came forth earlier, alignment and relationship. 
Because God will open your eyes to these things to set you free so that you can take a stand for truth. And so another individual does not have the ability to, to control you. Amen? How many of you at the end of the day, who do we answer to? We answer to the Lord, right? And when I value what God thinks above what other people think, it gives me the ability to follow God and not to follow people. Amen. I'm not saying we get rid of the love walk. I'm not saying we don't walk in love. I'm not saying we don't take care of people. Uh, but what I am saying is this. Nobody has a right to control you. And if you see somebody trying to control you, God wants to set you free from that. Then he goes on in the rest of the verse. It says, <clears throat> for your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And then he says this, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The God of peace. When you're dealing with someone who's operating in witchcraft, manipulation, and control, <clears throat> they will always rob you of peace. You'll always be thinking about them, thinking about what they think, thinking about what's going on in them, and you have no peace. It says, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. I mean, oh, God wants to lead you and guide you in peace. And one of the marks of a relationship that's been infiltrated by witchcraft, manipulation, and control is there's an absence of peace. I've been dealing with this thing for so many years. I mean, just not in a necessarily specific person, but throughout my life, you know, I mean, you know, legalism, it's all witchcraft, manipulation, and control. It's all about what does the pastor think about me? Does the pastor like me? Does the pastor not like me? Am I blessed? Am I not blessed? You know, and all these types of things. And what do people think about me? And what does this person think about me? And, you know, legalism, it just sets the stage for all this self-serving, man-pleasing. That's not really, nobody's really being led by God. Everybody's trying to please man. And that's not, that's not the way of the kingdom, Amen. But one of the defining characteristics is there'll be an absence of peace in, with any dealing of, with this person. How do you get free? You cut off their ability to um, manipulate you and control you, and you maintain your place of freedom. And you may ruffle some feathers. And how I many know not all of us are good at confrontation? There are some people who, who are just born with that. They like it. And they, they do. I mean, they have a per Amen. Some, some of them people in the room, right? Personality. <clears throat> personality type. And really, it's, it's people that tend to have more of a prophetic personality. And uh, they, 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 they feel very comfortable in confrontation. And we need that in the body of Christ. I didn't have that. I had to develop this. Like when I was a young person, man, you know, when I was like Ethan's age, I wouldn't even, if I was at somebody's house, I wouldn't even ask them for a cup of water. Like I wouldn't even, I wouldn't speak because I was just, very, I just how I was. But over time, the Lord has taught me there's a time to confront and there's a health in it and there's a strength in it and it actually maintains freedom. How many know a good shepherd will confront a wolf? A good shepherd, and, and someone look at, well, well, I, well, he obviously doesn't care about this person or care about this situation or whatever. No, how many know sometimes the role of a shepherd is to protect? And a part of protection is confronting. Because you're preserving a place of safety for the people. Are y'all tracking me here? And so I'm saying all this to say this might not be your natural personality. This might not. But, but how many know that, that God will develop something in your life that you're not strong in? I now have no problem with confronting people. Do I, Ethan? Ethan, Ethan, Ethan knows I have no problem confronting people. And I will. He's probably asleep over there. He was in Nashville. God love him. Look at him. <laughs> Just leave him alone. He, last, he, last night, they went to Nashville for a basketball game, and they went all the way down there in a charter bus. They played a game, and then they drove all the way back. He didn't get back. He didn't go to sleep until probably 2 o'clock in the morning last night. So, amen. We'll just love him in the presence of the Lord. Amen. It's all good. Amen. That's called grace, isn't it? <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Anyway, praise God. But it's something that God will develop in your life. Why is he going to develop in your life? How many know God wants you free? And remember, not only are you preserving your own freedom, how many know you're setting the stage for that person's deliverance? Because people can get free of this stuff.
if they make a decision to lay it down. Amen? So, in closing, God's called us to freedom. There's a glorious liberty that's coming to the body of Christ. We want to be a part of it. We want to get free. We want to stay free. We want to grow in freedom. It happens through the presence of the Lord, through truth. God wants us free from fear. God wants us free from legalism. God wants us free from every single form of bondage. God wants us free from sin. Amen. How many know we don't want to get a hold of the grace of God and understand you're forgiven and go give your go be brought under the power of sin? Can I get an amen? We want to stay free from that stuff as well. Our liberty is not a cloak of maliciousness. And then also, God wants you to be free from controlling, manipulating people. And God will highlight it. God will show it to you. How I many know oh, there are healthy relationships and there are unhealthy re- relationships? An unhealthy relationship is where somebody else feels like they have the, the power or the desire or the need to control your life. Amen? And how many know you've been called for freedom? Amen? Amen? Everybody got that this morning? All right, good. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray and uh, also want to pray for some people because we got some people in our church that are going through some stuff right now. And how many know there's power in agreement? Amen? Um, Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you that uh, every single person in this church is set free from fear, set free from the enemy trying to bring sin in their lives, set free from legalism. Lord, set free from any attempt at witchcraft and control and manipulation to control their lives. Lord, I thank you that you sever that, that you cut that off and you bring freedom to them individually. And Lord, I thank you that you bring freedom to our church, that there's no sense of control or witchcraft or manipulation in our church, in our ministry, not in this house and not online. But Lord, there's just a place of love and just a place of freedom. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are the good shepherd and you will confront any attack of the enemy that tries to come against us and you will preserve our freedom. Lord, we take a stand for the gospel. We take a stand for the good news. We, fit, we set our feet firmly upon the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, Lord, and we thank you for that. And Lord, we, we praise you for that. Father, right now, I just lift up Paul Bredberg unto you. And we, as a church, Lord, we just agree for a quick recovery uh, for him. Lord, I thank you for the success of the operation. I thank you that it went well. But Lord, we just speak a blessing over him. We speak recovery over him in Jesus' name. Father, we just lift up Casey unto you. And Lord, I just speak a blessing over her. And I just thank you for a complete and total recovery over her life. Lord, I thank you that you're healing her, Lord, in her physical body. You're healing her in her mind, Lord God. You're bringing deliverance to her. We thank you for that. Father, we lift up Tim and his mom unto you. And Lord, I just speak a blessing over Tim. Lord, I just thank you continue to strengthen him. You continue to encourage him and to give him wisdom. And I thank you, Lord, that they have favor with the medical community. And Lord, we just thank you for just a total deliverance for his mother, Lord God. I just thank you that she is released into eternity, Lord God, as she comes face to face with Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for that. And uh, Father, we just, we just lift up these folks unto you. We speak a blessing, we speak strength over them, we speak life over them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, if you need a giving envelope, giving envelope this morning, uh, Dan will get one to you. Those of you that are watching online, if you guys want to give, uh, you can give uh, through gracepointgeorgetown.com. Uh, and um, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Grateful for that. I get to teach at a uh, Bible college next week, man, in Tulsa. So I'm excited about that. Get to teach in the love of God. I'll be back. I'll be back on Saturday night. Uh, but I fly out on Wednesday and uh, get a chance to preach down there in that church and get a chance to teach on my favorite subject, which is the love of God. Amen. And uh, get to teach five parts on it. And I'll teach five different classes and it'll be recorded and be a part of that Bible college. And I'm excited about that. Appreciate your prayers. My biggest concern is that I don't start tapping into the prophetic and I just stay, I'm like Grant. I need to be like Grant. I need to just be able to get up and just teach what I have. And so um, that's, uh, I'm excited about that because I don't always get a chance to do that. But I'll be back on Saturday night. I'll be there with Peter Swart. You guys know Peter. Peter's out there in Tulsa and get a chance to, you know, spend time with him and uh, that church down there in that area. And Praise God. Hopefully it's warmer there than it is here. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck, right? <laughs> Tulsa's a little bit warmer than here, I think. I mean. Oh, I know. I know. Cold's everywhere, man. Yeah, I'd rather go to Tulsa when it's wintertime than summertime because I'm not a big fan of tornadoes, you know. 
That, they got the tornado. That's, that's the one thing about that area, man. I, I just don't think I'd move in the, in the tornado belt. You know, I just, no thanks, man. I mean, everybody down there has seen a tornado. That's just a part of your life. You know, yeah, last week we saw. Oh, I know, man. That area is just, you know, it's, you know, praise God. So going in, uh, going in January, amen. Praise God. No tornadoes. Hallelujah. Father, we just ask you to bless this offering. Thank you, Lord, you bless their, your people as they go their way. I think they have a great week ahead of them, Father. We thank you, Lord, you maintain, preserve, and grow our freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, you guys go in the peace and joy.